The Lord be with you. Good morning. Um, we come to church so that we can learn more about Jesus, so that we can be in God's presence, so that we can deliberately put ourselves into a place where we can be influenced by the Holy Spirit. I want to give you a thought as we head into the rest of our worship service today. Do you remember when you were a kid or when you had kids or were around kids and, and they were big enough to ride in the front seat and whenever there's more than one kid, one of them says, shotgun, and um, huge battles are waged over who gets shotgun. So today, I'm just going to leave you with that thought. We're going to listen to what the Holy Spirit might have to say about calling shotgun. So I'll just leave that with you. Um, the current color COVID phase is still yellow. We hope it'll get up to green at some point, but not yet. Uh, so that for us, that means that masks are optional if you've had your vaccinations, except please wear a mask when you're singing. Uh, in your voice, when the words in bold will be said together, and please add your voice when we sing. Uh, we have some big uh, things going on this, this next week. Um, Beth's installation service as pastor of Southminster, which includes Telos, will be next Sunday, uh, October 24th at 4.30 in the afternoon. And we really hope that everybody can be there. Uh, it's a formal, it's to formalize the relationship that Beth has to the church and that both Southminster and Telos as the church have with Beth. It's a really important thing to do. Afterwards, you get to play on the playground, actually on the, on the, on the grounds of the church. There'll be uh, several kinds of ball to do, uh, badminton, bocce ball, uh, also pizza and cookies, so come with an appetite. This will last from about 5.30 until 7. And I think Bethany has uh, something on the pumpkins. Yes. So as of now, the pumpkins are supposed to be here at 5.30 on Monday. So we need all the help we can get uh, unloading these pumpkins. And, um, you know, we'll keep you posted if we hear something during the day that they're coming early or they're running late or whatever. We Keep your eye on your email and your texts um, for that and recruit as many people as you possibly can. Uh, the other thing is, as far as signups, if you have signed up for a time that, like right now, today, yesterday, Friday, whatever, um, don't worry about canceling it, but go ahead and sign up for some more slots. Um, and we will, um, try, you know, we still got a lot of open openings for that. Um, and even if you're not signed up for a slot and you want to just stop by anytime during the time of the pumpkin patch, we can probably use your help. So that's that's that. Stay tuned. I won't make any announcement about the great pumpkin. <laughs> Let us call our sins to worship. Why do we come to worship? Perhaps it's for a glimpse of God's glory. But Jesus asks us, can you drink the cup that I drink? It is the cup of Jesus' own life, struggle, joy, suffering, hope, fullness of life. Why do we come to worship? And Jesus asks us, can you be baptized with my baptism? Baptiz baptized into God's family, God's reign, where the Holy Spirit breaks down barriers between people and where new relationships are created. Why do we come to worship? Perhaps if we are honest, it may be for our own honor or prestige. But Jesus gives us this challenge. To become great, you must serve. 
Why have we come to worship? To drink the cup of the fullness of life to immerse ourselves in learning to be more like Jesus, to learn how to serve so that the world may be healed. Holy God, with you there is enough, enough to provide shelter for all who seek you, food for all who hunger, and healing for all who suffer. Gather us into your presence today. Fill us with the confidence in your love for us that we may risk sharing Jesus' cup and baptism so that through us, the world might become a place with more of the justice and love you, come, you came to show. Shine your light on us. Give us boldness to serve one another and you on this adventure of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand. Let us join our hearts and voices as we confess our sins. Forgiving and saving God, we pray today for forgiveness. We have chosen power over, over service. service. Forgive us. We have sought glory rather than humility. Forgive us. We have pushed to the front when you have called us to the sidelines. Forgive us. Show us where we are needed. Show us how best to serve you and your people. Teach us to be your hands of healing and compassion in a world that surely needs us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Be assured. The Lord says in Psalm 91, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them. Children of God, be at peace. The Lord has heard our prayer and has forgiven our sins. Lord of all, as the scriptures are read and preached this morning, open our hearts and minds to your truth. Give us ears to hear what you would have us hear. Give us courage to follow where you lead us. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Psalm 91, verses 9 to 16. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. 
When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Barbara was here during the early service for a portion of it. And she said, Beth, I think you need to do the children's sermon in the second service. So I need a couple volunteers, Pat and Barbara and Rick, perfect. So we have Eli here this morning. We've got um, a bunch of kids who are you know, sick or sniffly and so. Yeah, so if, what'd you say? If, okay, you be the stand-in for Eli, right? Yeah. Come here. You don't have a boo-boo on your finger or a dinosaur band-aid to show us, but okay. So if you would line up behind Rick. In the daycare, whoever is the line leader is a big deal, very big deal. And um, so the, we, we made Eli, Rick, Eli, the line leader briefly. And so pretty cool position. Happy about that, Eli? Good deal. <laughs> and, but can you see the people behind you? No. So if Pat got lost, you wouldn't know. If Barbara tripped and fell, don't fall down, 
don't really do this. <laughs> you wouldn't know, would you? No. No. So you'd be just marching on along with nobody behind you if you were that kind of leader. So come here. What if you were the leader back here? And if Pat got lost and wandered off, you, you could say, wait, wait. We're doing the right. If Barbara tripped and fell, you could catch her. This is the way Jesus wants us to lead from here where we can take good care of one another. So put your hands, everybody hug your hands together. <laughs> I learned that from Tatiana. I used to say, hold hands with yourself, but Tatiana is, it says, hug your hands together. And I like that better. So let's say a prayer and you say the words after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, help us to lead, us to lead by, being last. by being last. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your suggestion, Barbara. And thank you, Pat and Rick and Barbara, for volunteering. So, here we are. We're going to get to why I asked you to think about calling shotgun. From Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. They were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. So surrounded as we are with the ways in which this world sees status and leadership and authority and power, how do we go from that to more fully embracing and living into what Jesus is describing here. How do we make it, as Jesus said, not so among us? Well, we'll get to that. But first, I want to talk about that tricky word there, ransom. It's one of those ver words that in English, it just gets us into theological trouble really quickly. So our modern way of understanding ransom just doesn't work in this context. It just doesn't make sense. So does God pay a ransom to Satan to free Jesus from death? Well, that gives evil way too much power and doesn't, it isn't supported by the rest of scripture. So does God pay God a ransom for Jesus? And that makes zero sense. So does Jesus pay God a ransom for us by dying. That just doesn't jive with the rest of what we see in scripture about the beautiful and intimate relationship between God and Jesus. 
it also reduces Jesus' death to some kind of transaction, which again just doesn't fit with the abundance and mercy and grace that we see of Jesus in the rest of the scriptures. So why the word ransom? It's a translation issue. The Common English Bible translates it this way. Jesus came to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. Liberating is different than ransoming. So the Greek word used um, there that is translated ransom in so many English versions is litron. Now, litron can be a form of pay payment, but not in the sense of a transaction where somebody buys something, and not in the sense where you pay a ransom for the release of a captive. Jesus is saying here that his death does something. It's more than just an inspiring martyrdom by the movement, by the movement leader in the first century Palestine. But it is not a ransom paid to something or someone. This litron, this liberation, is it's a liberation brought about by divine strength. It's kind of like a holy jailbreak. So it's translated here as ransom in so many English versions of the Bible has been misconstrued as a transaction between parties. And that leads to all kinds of problematic theologies. But if we look at the original language, this litron, it's rather a jailbreak, a, a liberation, if you will, a liberation from sin and death, a liberation from the illusion that we can be self-sufficient and self-made. It's a jailbreak from all that holds God's children captive from living full and abundant lives. And it's all that liberation is all brought about by Jesus' giving fully and completely of himself on the cross and in the resurrection. I know that that is kind of theological fine-tuning in some ways, but the idea of a ransom being paid is so often used to emotionally and spiritually manipulate people. I wanted to spend a few minutes just kind of pointing out the actual language used here. Now we'll get back to this idea about the greatest being the one who chooses to serve. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus announces three times that this whole thing, his ministry, the healings, the feeding of the 5,000, all of that, he announces that this is going to end in his suffering and death and resurrection. And each of those three times, his disciples immediately do and say things to let us know that they just really don't get it. Three times they hear Jesus say, things are going to get really bad before they get better. And each time they demand greatness or status on the world's terms. Verse 34, Jesus saying this about himself. It's in the third person, but he's speaking about himself. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. And as the scripture goes on, it's as if James and John heard, blah, 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 rise again. And immediately, James and John pretty much call shotgun. You know, they get to sit up in front with the driver of the car. To quote the sage of the small screen, Michael Scott from The Office, the rules of shotgun are very simple. The first person's to call shot when the side of the vehicle gets to sit in the front seat. So in a nutshell, that's what James and John are doing. Because like siblings calling shotgun, they think that's where the status and importance are. When my own kids were at the age of calling shotgun, I, it drove me nuts. And I used to say to them, can you tell me where that scoreboard is kept? <laughs> because it just drove me nuts. So James and John start out with Jesus with a question we all recognize. If we don't recognize it in ourselves, we recognize it in kids we've known. So just after teaching about his impending death, his, the suffering, James and John asked Jesus to do whatever they ask him. We want you to do whatever we ask you. 
Have you heard request, requests like that from kids? I want you to say yes, okay? Before the question comes. Or promise you won't be mad? That is inevitably followed by something infuriating, right? Jesus tells them to go ahead and ask, and they do. They want to sit right beside Jesus in his glory, probably thinking that if they're heading up to Jerusalem and there's going to be some kind of showdown and Jesus is going to be a conqueror in all of this, there's probably going to be a victory banquet, and why not ask for the seats of honor? Jesus says, basically, you don't know what you're asking. Can you handle what is about to happen to me when it happens to you? And they, who pretty much heard blah, 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 rise again, say, sure. And Jesus says, in a sense, I can't let you ride shotgun. Someone else is driving this car. Which, of course, is not the answer they were hoping for. The other ten disciples hear about it, and they understandably get mad at James and John. Because the disciples, all 12 of them, were still operating under traditional understandings about leadership and the meaning of being first and the meaning of being last. Because they still figured that calling shotgun was the way things worked. And so Jesus teaches them and us about what status in God's kingdom is like. Jesus reminds them of the ways they have seen power and influence and status wielded around them. And he says this, but it is not so with you. And he explains again, leadership is different in my kingdom. In God's realm, power is now about service. And leadership is about a servanthood mindset as a way of life. Jesus says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So in a sense, we're looking at a little episode of sibling rivalry in God's family. And from the outside of God's family, sibling rivalry among Christian brothers and sisters and siblings is just silly. We know there is enough of God's love for all of us to have more than we need. There's enough grace and mercy for all of us to have plenty. If Pat gets lots of grace and mercy, it doesn't mean I get less. It's not pie. So... Um, but the hard part for us is to avoid buying into that other way of looking, the world's way of looking at power, because sometimes it looks pretty effective. And yet we all know that maintaining that kind of power and authority is depleting, not just to our energy, but to our capacity for joy. Spending our energy going after the world's version of power will eventually shrivel our souls. Jesus' way of looking at leading and serving and status are so very different from the world's. Jesus said, but it is not so among you. Things are meant to be different among us than the way they are in the world around us. So how do we develop that kind of servanthood and humility that Jesus seems to be asking of us? How do we make that development genuine, not just for show? I think it's important to talk in terms of identity and mindset, not in a list of behaviors, because when we go to a list of behaviors, we end up with what social media calls the humble brag where somebody posts on something for all the world to see. Wow, it's such hard work setting up a nonprofit to help others, which is really a way of saying, oh, please notice that I'm doing this and reeling in, you know, so it's, it's just the same thing with a, another coat of paint on it. But one key idea here is cultivating. We can't grit our teeth and will ourselves all in our own strength to be more like Jesus. 
But we can choose to put ourselves in situations where we spend enough time with Jesus and with people who seem to be like him that we end up watching ourselves begin to be a little more like him. We can cultivate our growth in grace. We can make more room for the Holy Spirit to grow us into Christ's likeness. We can also monitor our own tendencies towards sibling rivalry in God's family. We can avoid any petty arguments about who's great, who has more status, or whose opinions count more. The kingdom of God is not best represented when we do that, is it? When we default to the world's way of evaluating importance and power and leadership and status, we miss out. We miss the opportunity for God to share something bold and new with us and with the world. When we spend our energy jockeying for position, we miss out on God's vision for the future for this little part of God's big family. As one author put it, every time we get caught up in ourselves, we miss a chance to hear God's voice. When we learn to serve each other, we help bring God's kingdom to reality here on earth as it is in heaven as we pray in the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. I think that's what can happen when we invest our energies into spiritual practices that help us be more attuned to what the Holy Spirit might be doing within us and among us. When we choose to not try to get our way out of love for one another, when we choose not to call shotgun, so to speak, I think this is the challenge and the invitation Jesus is offering us, that we might cultivate a community where status and leadership and power are deeply different from the world around us, that we create together with the Holy Spirit the kind of community Jesus meant when he said to his disciples, but it is not so among you. In the name of the one who invites us into a different kingdom. Amen. We come to our moment of generosity. And first, I want to say thanks for your generosity. We received $1,220 for the Peace and Global Witness Offering. The local share of 305 will go to the Mary Parish Center, which helps women and their children get out of abusive situations and back on their feet. Once again, we request donations to Southminster for families of Norman Binkley School. The school counselor has identified 50 families this year that, that could use $25 gift cards before Thanksgiving. And so we ask that you uh, contribute to Southminster for uh, I, I see a notice down here. <laughs> Pat. Yes. Okay. Well, so I have a check. It could be cash. It could be Venmo, I guess. You can go. Have we changed it yet? So you can go online. Soon, hopefully, we'll change it. So, okay, soon we will be able to go online and donate there. But I'm going to do the check and I'm going to walk over there, pick up an envelope out of the basket with the Norman Binkley sign, put the check in. It's made out to Southminster for Norman Binkley and write Norman Binkley on the envelope. Or I can just put the check or money in without putting it in an envelope. Simple, simple, simple. Thank you. Thank you for your illustration. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to say that your contributions for special projects like this and for maintaining the church 
and its ministry are always needed and always welcome. We have on Sunday mornings a offering plate here at the front, and if we have special offerings, we will note those also. But thank you for your support. Please stand. preacher once say about songs like that well if that doesn't get your fire going your wood's wet <laughs> so, <laughs> just kind of made me think of that friends we've come to our time when we lift one another up for um, prayer and um, concern and care and I want to we'll do our zoom family first 
and then we will head to the folks here in the sanctuary. So, um, Nancy. Don's sister, Connie, is feeling really low. Her test results are poor. She's no longer in a trial. She doesn't feel good. So she needs prayers for encouragement. Yeah. Let's lift Connie up. So. Loving God, through your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would give Connie encouragement and hope that is not of this world, but is of you. We ask for all those around her to know best how to encourage and support her in this hard, hard time. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others? Jeanette. No, there. Um, continuing prayers, please, for Daddy and Tracy and my sister and myself and Steve. Daddy was sent home from the um, rehab on Friday night and last seemed to do fairly well Saturday. Last night, Tracy had to call the ambulance people to help get him into bed because she couldn't do it by herself. And so he's in bed when she messaged basket me this morning before she had to go to her church service. And when she gets back home, I guess we'll look at where things are from there. He has said he doesn't want to go back to either the hospital or to the nursing home, but his mentation is not the best either. He talks about parts of himself being wires and connected to the computer. Mm. So I don't, but at other time, you know, but otherwise he's totally copacetic. So I don't, huh? Uh, yeah, and does not want either myself nor my sister and our hubbies to come to Texas. So I have no idea, but we all could sure, sure use some prayers mm -hmm. in this decision. Yes, ma'am. Let's, let's lift that situation up. Lord, for Bruce and Tracy, for Jeanette and her sister, for their spouses, we pray that you would give them wisdom and clarity. We ask that you would give Bruce um, as much comfort and healing as he can have in this time. We ask that you would give um, strength and courage in making hard decisions to the rest of the family. Lord, we pray that you would hold them all in the hollow of your hand. Lord, in your mercy. And there are others. Mary. Continued prayers for Anita Kimbrough. She had a little issue with her dialysis last week, but that's been resolved. So just to help give her more strength so she can continue to uh, improve with her rehab. Amen. Let's pray for Anita. Holy God, we lift up to you, Anita. We ask that you would strengthen and encourage her. Pray, Lord, that um, we thank you that this issue with dialysis has been worked out. We pray, Lord, that you would give her um, bright spirits and strength um, to continue with her rehab that she might be able to come home. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others? Pardon? Oh, okay. Sharon. Yes, ma'am. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Is that Sharon or Nancy? Okay. Oh, um, if you are talking, Sharon or Nancy, we cannot hear you. Your microphone is muted. 
there we go. Still can't hear you. Okay, so how, how's this? That's great, thank you. Okay, Nancy's, Nancy's gonna talk. Um, I, I'd like to ask for prayers from my son, Steve Young, who lives in Tampa, Florida, and has recently found out that he has heart disease and, um, and uh, is having a number of problems related to that at this time. He has some real good doctors, so uh, we just need prayers for him. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Lift up Steve. God, we lift up Steve Young. We ask that you would um, give, give him, give his family all strength to cope with a very difficult diagnosis. We thank you that he has good doctors that the family feels good about. We pray that he, as he enters into whatever treatment is ahead, that you would strengthen the family and give him courage to face that struggle. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others? All right. Pat. Mm -hmm. Right, let's lift them up. I'm sorry, I need to repeat that for you so that the people on Zoom can hear it. Pat is asking for prayer for Lori Donaldson. She's having a treatment tomorrow, and it's apparently similar to a treatment she's had before, to which she did not respond well. And Pat has helped us to remember that um, to pray for all who have long term um, medical con conditions in our church. Let's pray. God, we lift up Lori to you and ask that this treatment tomorrow might be different from the previous one, that it might help. It might uh, bring her some mobility and freedom from pain. And for all among us, Lord, in our family who struggle with long-term illness and the exhaustion and frustration that that brings, we ask that you would help us to be as Christ to them and that you would give them courage and strength in the face of those illnesses. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others here in the... Um, I would ask prayers for two things. Many of you guys hear me talk about my cousin, Jenny. She fell on Friday trying to get, it's a long story, but she was trying to get through an automatic closing gate and fractured her ankle. And their house is all stairs. Um, and so she truly and deeply hates crutches right now. So I'm ask your prayers for that. And then also your, um, your session is meeting tonight for our regular monthly meeting. We'd ask, I'd ask that you would keep um, all of us in prayer, that we would hear what the Spirit might be saying to the church. Let's pray. Lord, be with Jenny. Touch her and heal her. And Lord, be with our session as we meet tonight. Help us to be, have open hearts and minds to what you might have for us. In Jesus' name, Lord, we, Lord, in your mercy. Let's continue in our prayers, and we'll be singing some of our prayers as we have in the past. Holy God, in three persons, we wonder at you. Mighty enough to carve out the mountains, yet tender enough to be born as a baby. Powerful enough to conquer death, but humble enough to pause by a well with an ostracized woman. We marvel at the complexities of you, and we long for you to show us the way. Show us, O oh God, how to use the bits of power that we have to break the chains of injustice. But teach us to do that without the misuse of influence and without the desire for personal glory. Help us find ourselves in your song, the one that rings out that whoever wishes to be great will be a servant to all. Oh, 
God, it can be so hard to ask for help. We often worry about being a burden, and we know others often have needs bigger than our own. Help us to trust that we can come to you with the aches of our hearts for the world, our communities, our families, and ourselves. Give us the courage to share the journey with our fellow servants, to carry the load when we can, and allow others to support us when our legs wobble. Help us find ourselves in your song. of light and life, there is so much strife in our world. It can be difficult to catch a glimpse of hope sometimes. We pray for all whose joy has been cast in shadow, those in the grips of depression and addiction, refugees with no safe place to call home, your children living with heavy medical news, for caretakers in hospitals, for public safety, and for our homes. We pray for all who long for relief and celebration. And we pray that you will show us how to tap into our creativity, into our talents and our voices and our time to do whatever we can to alleviate pain, to extend compassion and offer comfort. Help us to find ourselves in your song. Thank you, O oh God, for the example of our servant Lord, Jesus Christ. Help us find ourselves in his example and in prayer as we join our voices, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand.
us go forth from this place in this time together, being as Christ to one another, raising one another up, stepping aside to make room for those who are left out, seeking not to be served, but to serve. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen.